Okay, so so we don't have to worry about it. We are, we are very, very fortunate this afternoon. Sharon Barnes, Professor Sharon Barnes, Dr. Sharon Barnes, she is a long-standing friend. I think she's done it every year, in fact, just about a quarter of a century. And every year she comes up with something new, something fresh, and she's a great supporter of the whole venture. And we're very, very honored to have Sharon speaking with us. And since you are next, I should watch my list more closely. But I'm glad I've got people to help me. So whenever you are ready, Sharon, I'm ready. take over. And if you gave, did you give me permission already to share? You should be able to on the bottom of your screen. Yeah, it looks like, can you see it? Not yet, but Not yet. Now, now I we, see. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I is. am. I'm so thankful to all of you. And I've been listening. I've had a few students come in, so I've been in and out. But um, I don't know what is in the drinking water that you're sharing across the uh, your various locations, but it's making you a little loopy, and I, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you very much for organizing the event again. And it's always a, a joy to participate. And it's also one of my favorite events of the year. I'm talking this year, uh, those of you who have heard me talk in the past, I usually talk about uh, children's books. This, this book is not a children's book, but it, it shares uh, a quality with the other books that I talk about that it talks about LGBTQA plus uh, experience. The text is called In the Dream House. Um, before I talk more about that, though, I just want to thank all the partners, um, including um, Moji, Dr. Moji, Arjun, all of you who have done, done this for so many years. It's just a pleasure to be here. And I also specifically wanted to ta uh, thank my department and uh, Dr. Barbara Alice Mann, whose talk I am very deeply sorry that I missed uh, earlier today. Um, Dr. Mann gave me permission to share this slide, which is of her creation, uh, it, to attempt a um, acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples whose land we're on. And I was very heartened to hear other folks doing that also. Um, and especially, I think, um, given Dr. Mann's contribution to this event, but also her ferocious intellect and um, enormously high quality research that we're so very lucky to have her, uh, an indigenous scholar on our campus. Um, it's important for us to acknowledge the many peoples uh, whose homelands uh, we're, we're standing on. And I just wanna mention the book, Land of the Three Miamis, uh, which is one of Dr. Mann's many books, which is also about this region. Um, and so if you're curious, and it's also um, put out by the University of Toledo Press. So uh, a good way to support the university, to support Dr. Mann, and to support the indigenous people who still live, work, and have their homes here. So uh, thanks to Dr. Barbara Mann for keeping, uh, keeping me motivated in many cases. Uh, and this is my home turf uh, here in women's studies. Here are some of our folks. I just want to thank them for their inspiration and um, the motivation. So uh, lots and lots of good gratitude all around. Um, and I want to apologize to those of you who have heard me talk before. You've seen this almost exact slide, uh, but something that I've started doing as part of this uh, event is to share sort of some terms and some statistics. And I'm sure other folks have done this too, but since you come and go, it might be new to you. Uh, one of the things that I think happens is the image there on the uh, right of your screen is what we think of when we think of censorship or banned books. We think of, you know, a book burning. And um, in fact, there's some more nuance to the, to the behavior and to uh, what we mean when we say banned books. So there's a couple of terms there highlighted in white. Um, censorship, which covers sort of a broad territory, banning and challenging. And um, the Office for Intellectual Freedom, uh, the American Library Association, who is the organization that since 1982 has been compiling a list of books that have been uh, banned, censored, challenged in some way. Um, they started doing it, at, it, the American Library Association's librarians were reporting uh, sort of an alarming rise in challenges. And so they, they started to keep track and it has become this event that we, we participate in today. 
Um, but there's a, a really a difference. So uh, a challenge, um, and I have the exact language, um, a challenge is a formal written complaint filed with a library or school requesting that materials be removed because of content or appropriateness. That's a challenge. Uh, so when a book is challenged or a material, it doesn't have to be a book, is challenged, it doesn't mean that it's removed or restricted. Uh, but when it is removed or restricted, so we say you have to have your parents' permission to check this book out or uh, you have to have your ID checked in some way, that would, we would consider that banned. Um, it doesn't mean that there is, this book disappears from the country or it disappears more broadly. It could be just one individual library. It could be a school district. And that is the case of the book I'm talking about today. Uh, but it, banning in one place, the good news is it doesn't mean it's banned everywhere all over the place. Um, one, one thing I would say is the bad news is uh, there are lots of different ways a book can be challenged, um, including interestingly, this book that I'm talking about in the dream house. Um, and I, I have a copy, but I'm gonna tell you, it's I had to get it through interlibrary loan. And the reason I had to, because when I tried to get it at the Lucas County Public Library, two of, there were four copies, two of them were checked out and two of them were missing. And I checked back all summer long and they were missing all summer long. So banning or challenging or censorship I guess I should call that censorship, happens in all kinds of ways. It's not just uh, uh, authority figures. I guess maybe technically it's not censorship if it's an individual. I, I don't know. One of you experts might have to tell me about that. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that there's all different kinds of censorship. And, and this book being hard to get, I had to get it from the University of, or Ohio University in Athens. Uh, so that, I think, is worth noting. Um, one thing I usually always do, too, is talk about how many books, uh, the number changes from year to year. Uh, the st statistics I got for this year were from 2008. I don't know why I couldn't get a, a newer version. Uh, between 2000 and 2009, um, over 5,000 books have been challenged. Um, 156 were to library, school, and university materials and services. 273 books were included in that. Um, that's this year. Uh, 377 in 2019 and 348 2018. Those are the individual year statistics. Sorry, I messed that up a little bit. Uh, what is banned or challenged? 62% um, books. 15% um, is programming. So like someone could challenge our right to do this event. Uh, 10% targets databases, magazines, films, and games. Um, and you could imagine people might challenge games that people can check out of libraries for all kinds of reasons, maybe violence, et cetera. 6% target artwork and displays, and 7% target things like social media um, and access. Interestingly, in the last couple of years, drag queen story hours have been really challenged. Um, they were very popular for a while. Um, and one thing I've noticed in my years, 20, how many, four years of participating uh, is that LGBTQ content is challenged significant, at significant high, significantly high rates. Um, one year, eight of the top 10 challenged books had LGBTQ content. Who challenges? You might be surprised. Um, parents are by far the largest group at 32%. Um, uh, I think in 2018, it was 42%. I think that was the highest I'd ever seen it. Um, second, almost always is patrons, whoever uh, uses the library or service. Uh, and this year, that was 33%. School boards and administrations, 13%, uh, librarians and teachers, 10%, political or religious groups, 6%, eleven elected officials, 3%, and students, 3%. Um, I have seen reports of outside organizations, especially like Focus on the Family, um, conservative political groups who sometimes target um, individual libraries and threaten lawsuits. I've seen a rise of that, although I didn't see any of that on the ALA website this year. Um, where are they challenged? Uh, public libraries, 59%. School libraries, 23%. 
14% in schools themselves, like the classrooms, individual classrooms, and 3% in academic libraries. So way less likely to happen at a university than um, a public school. 1% in prison uh, libraries or other kinds of institutions. Um, the, the, sometimes in a school, it could also be a reading list, like students had options and someone wanted one of the options removed. And that's the case of the I Am Jazz, the, the book about the transgender youth. Uh, but it's also the case about the book I'm talking about today. It was on a reading list. So students had other options on this list, but the parent wanted this book removed as an option. Um, on the why question, you, as you might imagine, um, it, you would be startled, but typically sexual explicitness ranks very high um, and right around that um, inappropriate for age group, which is also often about sexuality, um, profanity, vulgarity, and maybe reasons that might be more surprising like anti-police content or its religious viewpoint. And those of you who have seen me talk before, I used to talk about the Harry Potter series and it was targeted for religious viewpoint even though if you, it doesn't really advocate pagan religion, but uh, folks challenge it for that. Uh, my observation is that a lot of times sexual explicitness is only targeted if it's LGBTQ sexual explicitness. So even when it doesn't say LGBTQ content, if you look, sometimes it is that. Um, I do want to say, though, this year, by far um, the most uh, number of challenges, I think, I didn't look, I didn't count, but it's usually LGBTQ content. This year it was racial, uh, racially uh, focused content. And I think it's a really interesting um, shift a as a sort of, I think, con consequence of the Black Lives Matter movement that um, people are concerned about people reading about racism because we know there's uh, attempts to uh, sort of um, censor what teachers can teach. Uh, critical race theory has been attacked. So I think it's not surprising that this year the list is way more focused on material that explores racism, sadly. Um, so before I move into the dream house, the one other thing I want to say is that this is not a definitive list um, because what happens is, as in the case of in the dream house, um, books disappear. And that's another kind of censorship or a librarian says, I can see this is gonna cause a problem, I'm not gonna order it. Or an administrator says, this is disgusting, whips it in the garbage and says, don't order another one. And those are not necessarily all reported. These are things that are reported by librarians. Um, and so we think that there would be a much larger number if we knew. I read a statistic that said, I think, um, Oh, I know I, I know I wrote it down. Uh, this past year, there could have been as many as 1,800 challenges, uh, but we have that much smaller number of a couple hundred. Um, and I think lucky for us, uh, there's events like this and very committed people, very committed librarians who want to make sure that we have access to the information that we are looking for or didn't know we were looking for in some cases. And I have to say about in the Dream House, um, Carmen Maria Machado's book, I, I wasn't looking for this information and uh, I read the crit criticism first. I found the topic because there was an article in the New York Times about the protest, uh, which was, I'll, I will share with you if I have time. I'm gonna run out of time. Um, I wanna say the, the book is about uh, an abusive lesbian relationship. And I wanna share just, uh, uh, you know, the relationship starts out ideal like all relationships, right? And then, uh, and then it becomes very abusive. And it's her story about not just, um, what happened to her, but how, because it was a lesbian relationship, there was no uh, story about what to do in an abusive relationship, no, no language, no story. She calls it no archive of information about what was happening to her. The, the, the abuse was largely emotional, uh, enormous amount of um, swearing, um, you know, accusations, a, a lot of things that if you know anything about abusive relationships are very common. Um, but there wasn't anything, she didn't have any 
context for this in lesbian relationships. And so it took her a very long time to understand um, and define her relationship as abusive. Um, and I'm kind of happy that I'm running out of time, so I maybe don't have to share the, um, I'll just share the photo. <laughs> but if you want to, if you want to uh, YouTube her, she reads to Ed, this is her, uh, Lori Hines is her name, uh, and that's a sex toy. It's a, a, a dildo on a harness that she brings and whips out and slaps on the table uh, dur during her reading. And she, she reads the two most explicit sexual scenes in the book. I mean, uh, when I heard her read them, I was like, wow, that is pretty graphic. Uh, but then when I read the book, I was like, wow, I think those might have been the only two sex scenes in the entire book. Like the book is about something else and something very, very important. Um, so I don't have time to share it too bad. But uh, it's, it's basically just two graphic sex scenes. And she argues that these are not appropriate for teenagers. And honestly, when I heard it, I was like, wow, that is, that's pretty graphic. I'm trying to imagine myself a parent of a teen, with, you know, with a 15-year-old that I want them. It's certainly not more graphic than um, heterosexual sex scenes, let me just say it like that, which teenagers are seeing everywhere and reading and whatever. Um, what I always say in my presentation, and the, this is true in this one as well, is that there, there was a response that was equally passionate. Um, oh, let me back up and say the book was pulled. And so were several other books. Um, from the 15 titles that they had to choose from, six were chosen for removal after complaints. And she was not the only person to complain. Over 2,000 parents complained, and that's a lot. Um, three books were also pulled for review, and 13 more were challenged across the school district's um, lists of various age groups, um, mostly because they were considered um, inappropriate for their age group. Uh, the school board is saying that they're going to revise their policy, uh, but it's important to notice that or to note that they actually included books with, an, with, a, with a mindset toward increasing their diversity. Like that, that was the intent of this book list. And so uh, there's tension between the, the community or some members of the community uh, and the schools. Um, but but like, like these images uh, on your screen indicate, lots of students spoke out and lots of um, other parents spoke out as well saying, hey, you know, we pay professionals to put these lists together. If you don't want your kid to read it, have them pick a different book. Just don't decide for the rest of us that you can't read it. Interestingly, Lori Hines in the video says, I am not advocating censorship, but she absolutely did want the book removed, uh, which is the ALA's technical definition of, of banning or censoring. Um, so other folks had uh, a lot of uh, commentary uh, and, and sort of pushback, uh, although in, in this case, uh, books actually were removed. But I would argue the plus side is uh, the students and the community all got a lot of education about censorship and about the importance of the right to read. And um, one thing that followed up, PEN America, which is also an anti-censorship group, wrote a public letter to the school district, um, you know, advocating for uh, returning the books to the list and talking about uh, how important and vital exposure to difference is uh, for a plural democracy and for um, building empathy and correcting historic gaps in our um, literature, uh, which has been dominated, of course, by white uh, white people, white men, writers, white male authors specifically. So they they also gave pushback that got national attention. Margaret Atwood was one of the signatories. Very many famous authors signed on. Um, and how important it is to be exposed to difference um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a democracy that values freedom of speech as we say we do. Um, so uh, finally, uh, on my last slide, and I know this has also come up today, I heard a little snippet at one point, uh, but I wanted to also mention it, that um, in the state of Ohio, so bringing this back home, there is a bill, uh, 327, and I also think there's another one that I don't know about, so if, like a 322. So if somebody knows about that, please chime in. Uh, but it's basically prohibiting teachers from teaching um, divisive concepts. 
And um, interestingly, I, I read the bill, it's or, or the, the part that was salient to this talk. And um, they do say you are allowed to talk impartially about these topics. Uh, but as for my perception, perception as a women's studies teacher, uh, there is no way for me to talk impartially about racism or sexism or homophobia or ableism or sexual assault, you know, um, or the Holocaust or genocide or, you know, these are these are topics that we need to um, speak from a value perspective. And that's very, really important. So um, we have a responsibility to weigh in on this bill. And we have a responsibility to speak out about censorship as well as uh, our right to critique racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, etc. Um, so please take take a moment if you have uh, some time to um, tell your representative what you think about this bill. And that's it for me. Uh, already over this year. I can't, it goes so fast. Uh, it really does. Uh, but I'm happy to take comments or questions and fill in uh, what I what I missed. So I'm going to stop sharing and um, if I can remember how. There we go. Yes, Sharon, it's always, I just love the way you go over the numbers. I, I do have some numbers that are a little more recent. Oh, thanks. It's, if I can find them right here, here they are. I have all this stuff stacked around me. <laughs> but for 2020, 156 challenges and 273 bands. I'll make sure you get the PDF for this year's field guide. Thank you. I thought I had sent links to everybody, but I'll send everyone the PDF. That's what I have. I must have, I must have just not realized I had up to date info. I thought it was 2018. The way they write it, it's hard sometimes to find the exact information. They should make a graphic, yes, they I should. think, and put the graphic somewhere where we could all see it and we could all say, oh, look at that. That's what's going on. And what's kind of chilling this year is 58 of the, the bands were in public libraries and public challenges. So that's probably because of the political landscape we're in, because a lot of book banning does follow the political landscape. Let's open it up to questions. I'm so glad you're all here. Sharon, so who has a question or a comment? Sharon, you have a question from Bree Scott on YouTube who also likes your mug. Uh, the, the question is, uh, what's your personal favorite LGBTQA plus novel? Oh boy. Impossible, impossible. You know what I would say, maybe Zami, a new spelling of my name by Audre Lorde or uh, poetry. Some people don't think Emily Dickinson was a lesbian, but I'm a huge Emily Dickinson fan, so I might go there. Too, too, far too many to name. I'm also a big, big fan of Sh Sherry Moraga. Um, she has a book of called, uh, oh, I'm going to mess up the name, but it's a, ch a changing, a, ch a Chicana Codex of Changing Consciousness. Um, not a novel, but a book I really love. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, thanks for that question. Wow, I should have had a better answer. More, more books. Harry Potter. Now that we know Dumbledore's gay, we could also say Harry Potter. <laughs> you did a lot for us with Harry Potter. I did. That was great. We had our own resident expert on <laughs> Harry Potter. She kept up with every book and everything and all yeah, the, it was the fun. crazy cutting parties and all that weirdness around that book. Do I did to want to say they do burn books still. It, that oh, image yeah. is not just a, unfortunately, not just a, a stereotype that does happen. Oh, and there's a minister in Florida who has cutting parties and they all bring a box cutter. And what's so weird is when they do that, the author can do a little dance because then the book sells more. So they buy all the copies of the book 
And so the publisher doesn't really know. So it's so ironic. Yeah. Like if, if when my book gets published, we got to get it banned. So everybody yeah. read it. Right. Yeah. It really, it does have that effect, but yeah. I do. And so part of me is like, oh, it's kind of great that that happens. But I also feel like the, the context matters, like the, that, that we're looking at bills telling us we can't teach certain topics. I mean, yeah. I think it's a, it, it's, it's a scarier time to think about book banning in that, I don't know, to me, it feels scarier than usual. I think it's, it's totalitarian to me that they're going to make laws like that. It's like, and I think it's 26 states have some version of a bill like this. Yeah, 12 have passed. Oh, I gotta get the list of the ones that have passed and the 26 that have are still in, or maybe it's all, you know, together. Not clear on those numbers right now, but do we have any other comments or questions for Sharon? Such a good job, Sharon. All oh, thank you. Thank you. I just I always say in women's studies, we are biased. We believe women matter. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're biased from the out from the outset oh yeah yeah thanks, I'm thanks biased. i think students matter and i think oh. that their critical thinking and their opportunities to cri critically think are vital i don't think that we should ever stand in the way of them asking mm -hmm. questions and raising issues that's what education is about it's not about namby pamby and oh we all agree with each other and isn't it a beautiful day and we can just spit back all these facts that we read no mm -hmm. it's about frames and context and personal experience and and what it all means